Blood boils when you watch it, doesn't it? You know what makes it worse? 12 years after this happened, these men actually walked away scot-free. In 2012, these 39 ghouls barged into a private property in Karnataka's Mangaluru, roughed up these youngsters, disrobed and molested women and even dropped them. They pretend to be custodians of culture and religion, but they wanted to use it as an excuse to go after these youngsters. As a young reporter who had travelled to Mangaluru to report on this, I was shocked, disgusted and enraged. But years later, it feels worse when you realise there were no repercussions for any of these groups. This week, I'll tell you all about a birthday party in a homestay that turned into a nightmare for 13 youngsters and why 39 goons walked free in this case even though everybody knew they did it. It all started with a birthday party, when Vijay Kumar and Sarita, who shared a birthday, decided to celebrate together with their friends. They rented out the Morning Mist homestay in Mangaluru. Along with a few of their friends, they gathered for what was supposed to be a laid-back afternoon of cake cutting, lunch and a few beers. But things took a dark turn they never saw coming. Suddenly, about 40 men from Hindu Jaganavedike, a Hindutva outfit, stormed into the homestick. They chased, slapped and punched the guys, yanked the girls by their hair, tore their clothes off and even molested some of them. They stole their phones, wallets and jewellery. This was no ordinary attack. It was a planned, vicious assault caught on camera. By the time the police showed up, it was all over. But instead of arresting the attackers, they let them go. This incident could have ended like many others. Attackers walking free and the victims sent home with a call to their parents. But things took a different turn thanks to a Manguluru-based journalist, Naveen Suranji. He reported the story immediately and soon footage of the assault was all over national TV, shocking viewers from across the country. The police under pressure had no choice but to take action, putting the then BJP government and its chief minister Jagdi Shetar in a tough spot. Even hardline Hindutva leaders like C.T. Ravi were forced to condemn the attack. By the way, many of us here at the News Minute had reported on the incident when it happened. Sudipto, Anisha and I had reported from the ground. Over the years, we have continued to track the activities of these attackers and their outfits because this was not by any measure a one-off. And while they stayed relentless, we too have to continue to focus on their crimes that are committed under the garb of religion and culture. And 12 years later, this piece by Anisha is the only comprehensive article that shows how 39 goons got away. If you like our journalism, then support our reporters by becoming a paid TNM subscriber. You can also read this article by clicking on the link below. Hindutva groups tried to control the narrative, giving this incident a spin. They started spreading fabricated stories about drugs being found at the homestay, though the police confirmed there were none. Thanks to Naveen's reporting and his detailed essay on the events, the right-wing narrative of a rave party was effectively countered. Even though Naveen exposed the attack, the Mangaluru police booked him, claiming he knew about the incident beforehand. But Vijayev, one of the victims, made it clear he never mentioned Naveen in his complaint. This notwithstanding, Naveen was arrested and spent over four months in jail. During his bail hearing, Vijay strongly defended Naveen and he was then granted bail. A year later, the 13 young women and men who were attacked were still dealing with the aftermath. They lost jobs, faced judgment from those who believed the rumours and some women were so shaken, they didn't leave their homes for months. But all the assailants were out on bail. Fast forward to 2024, Judge S. V. Kantaraju dismissed the victims' testimonies 
and even the video footage acquitting all 39 accused. His reasoning? He said there wasn't enough material evidence linking them to the crime. Can you imagine what the victims must have gone through? They were assaulted, defamed, and their lives were derailed. And after the long wait, all their attackers just walked away scot-free. This is a pattern we have seen in other such cases in Mangaluru. Remember the pub attack led by this man, the notorious Sri Ram Seni chief Pramod Mutalik. Even here, the attackers got away, especially because the victims did not want to testify. But this case, the homestay one, seemed different at first because the victims decided to stand up and fight back by filing complaints. There were a few common characters between the two attacks. In the case of the homestay attack, leading the mob was Subhash Padil, a notorious school who was also involved in the 2009 pub attack. I'd interviewed Subhash Padil just a couple of days after the homestay attack, and on candid camera, he had no hesitation in admitting that he led the attack and showed no remorse. My colleague Sudipto had written this piece in 2021 on how Padil, who was a street fighter in the mid-2000s, grew in stature with these vicious attacks. I recommend that you read this piece to get a better understanding of how these people operate. The link, of course, is in the description. Padil was not the only one. Eight others who were part of the homestay attack had also been part of the pub attack. Now with their acquittal, there's real fear that these goons will feel invincible and continue their attacks, especially on interfaith friendships and couples. During the trial, the prosecution's case hinged on the statements of two of the victims. Vijay Kumar and Gurudat Kamar, both of whom identified the attackers in open court. Vijay had clearly described how they tore the clothes of his women friends and abused them. A couple of them were even molested. But during the cross-examination, he admitted that it was dark and he could not exactly say which of the accused had attacked whom and in what manner. So the judge was not convinced and he picked apart his testimony, citing inconsistencies. The thing is, the trial in the case began in 2019, seven years after the incident happened. So you can actually imagine what the state of mind would have been. The police also did not conduct an identification parade, which is supposed to be a key part of the identification process. Basically, victims pick out the accused from a lineup of suspects rounded up by the police. Guru Dat Kamat, the second key witness for the prosecution, described the horrific scene in court. He recounted how the attackers tried to molest one woman, another woman jumped from the first floor to escape, and several women had their clothes torn off. One of the attackers, Sharon, was filming the women, and others even tried to stop the women from hiding their faces from the camera. Identifying the accused in open court, Guru Dutt said, All the accused were participants in the incident. Some of the attackers are not present in court, but I can identify them if I see them. But the judge again said his statements were contradictory. Since all the attackers came in at the same time, it was not possible to observe all of them correctly. Another victim, a young woman, took the stand and identified her attacker. She told the court that she was in the balcony at the time of the attack and one of the attackers, Ganesh, dragged her in, threw her on the bed and slapped her heart several times. She'd fainted for a bit and when she came about, she was slapped again by him. She injured her eye and her ear. The judge brushed aside her testimony, saying that, again, an identification parade was not conducted and that she did not reveal the details of the attack to the doctor when she went in for her treatment, although there's no compulsion under law to do so. During the trial, the prosecution called 47 witnesses, including 11 of the 13 victims from that day. Out of these 11, four were declared hostile. Among the five victims who were partly hostile, three were women whose testimonies were deemed by the judge as not sufficient, not helpful to the prosecution, or not trustworthy. All this because they could not specify how they were assaulted, in what order. In the days after the attack, many of us had thought that the video evidence that seemed to capture the attack in much detail would be sufficient to get these goons convicted, because the video was crucial. It showed the brutality of the Hindu Jaganavedike goons in real time. The police did use the footage recorded by Rajesh Pujari, the video journalist who was with Naveen, to identify and arrest the attackers. A month after the homestay attack, the police seized two memory cards from Rajesh. 
Forensic expert Deepak Rao, who holds a doctorate in cybercrime investigation, confirmed that the footage was not tampered with and submitted his report to the police. He reiterated this in court as well. But during cross-examination, it came out that the police hadn't collected a certificate proving his qualifications and that he hadn't signed the forensic report. Adding to the confusion, the judge dismissed the statement of Rajesh Pujari. Pujari had consistently maintained that he had accompanied Naveen to the home state, handed over the memory card with the assault footage to the police and confirmed in court that the video shown was indeed his recording. He rejected the video evidence for three main reasons. He doubted Deepak Krau's qualifications. He said the footage was not fully reliable because of the incomplete test and because of a missing document required under the Indian Evidence Act. As you can imagine, the court's acquittal of all 39 of those goons shocked and disappointed many people. Legal experts argue that the judge was too focused on technicalities and inconsistencies rather than getting to the truth. The victims who identified their attackers and had video evidence to back them up were left without justice. The 39 goons walked away. But the attack happened, obviously and undeniably. With the acquittal, the fear now is that it will embolden goons like these to carry out more attacks, knowing that they'll never probably be held accountable. Over the last 12 years, such attacks on interfaith friends and couples have increased and spread to other parts of Karnataka too. While these goons use the term moral policing to describe their activities, it's clear that their attacks are not just immoral, but blatantly illegal too. Now tell me what you think of what happened here. Do you think the police botched up the case? Or should the court have appreciated the evidence put in front of it? Do write to me at pooja at the newsminute.com and tell me what you think of this entire episode. By the way, here at the News Minute, we are upping our video and podcast game. For that, to match our video output, we are building a brand new studio. I'm recording this in a partially completed studio. And if you want to help us get across that finish line, then do consider contributing. There is a link in your description. You can click on that and contribute any amount of your choice.